uh, and I work here at the art museum and I will be your tour guide today. I will let you know that I will be taking my mask off when we get back there since we're recording so that it doesn't get too muffly and the mic can pick it up okay. Um, but there's plenty of room in the gallery space. We're looking at mostly large photographs so everyone will be able to see without having to crowd around too close. So if you just follow me, we are going to go to the galleries in the back. Before we get into the exhibition itself, I just want to point out um, our program here called Poses of Beauty. We worked in conjunction um, with communities here in Fort Wayne to get our own local African American men and women and families to talk about what beauty means to them and to put their own statements down at the bottom of photographs and we photographed them around the museum so that we can have our own local conversation with this national exhibition that's been touring for over a decade at this point. So after the exhibition, after we talk about it, I encourage you to come back out here and to see what some individuals from our own community have to say about beauty and how important it is to them and what it is to them. So we'll move on in now. All right. So this is Posing Beauty, and if I start to get too quiet for you guys, just tell me to speak louder because sometimes I get quieter the longer I talk during a tour. So this exhibition is comprised of three different themes, and we have them each divided into three different galleries with this space back here. And Posing Beauty itself is an exhibition that celebrates and explores what beauty is in African and African American culture. And this is done kind of juxtaposed against what historically we've been kind of told that beauty is, because beauty isn't just a one size fits all, and this exhibition beautifully captures that. And the first theme of this exhibition is body and image. Now with body and image, it's just kind of how, the way, how does the way we interpret the body reflect our own image, our own ideas of beauty. And in this room, um, fine art photographers have used either um, self-portraiture or portraiture of others to explore what is beauty, how do our ideas of beauty influence how we want to see it in a frame or how we see ourselves with that beauty? And the first collections we're going to look at are these four pieces here. These are by the artist Sheila Pre Bright and it is from her Plastic Body series. Now I have been very taken by this group of four. They're a small section of a larger body of work, but I mean, at first we just have, oh, it's Barbies. It's how we interpret Barbies. But the closer you look, you'll see that these Barbies have been mushed together with the faces or body parts of real women. And the longer you look at them, the longer you see the differences. I encourage you guys to really get up there and check those out. Now, next to these three works that include features from African-American women's, we have just your regular old classic Barbie. We all know what this Barbie looks like. She probably had the black and white swimsuit. I had her when I was little, um, and I wasn't allowed to play with her because she had a stand. She was a collector's. But um, she has that classic kind of Barbie eyes and that makeup, and we know what she looks like. She has always had an unattainable figure, unattainable beauty. 
And so what Sheila has done is she's talking about how, how does this affect how not only women themselves as a whole, but specifically women of color who already have a smaller degree of representation in mass media with toys or magazines. And she's having that discussion with her viewers, that idea of that idea of other, of how I cannot attain this. And she kind of makes the Barbies look real in a way. Because here we have, it looks just like a normal torso of a Barbie, but this is a real stomach that it has been cut and pasted into the Barbie clothes. We have a real woman's dreads here against a plastic Barbie body. And then this one, I feel like this one speaks the most volumes out of the four. We have one half here that is just total Barbie, but then we have a real woman's eye that's been placed underneath this drawn on painted eyebrow. And the angle of the mouth isn't perfect, like this plastic Barbie doll with that Cupid's bow, that tiny little rosebud lip. And she looks like a normal person. And in a way she looks sad, but it's the idea of, is she actually, does she, is she a sad person or does she just look normal because she doesn't have that Barbie makeup? So that's one thing I really like, really liked about Sheila's work, especially when you take it all in as a whole with that thoroughly plastic Barbie in the middle. And we're gonna turn our attention to another work over here. This work is by a contemporary artist, and his name is Omar Victor Diop, and he is Senegalese. He is from Africa, and he works in both fine art photography and also advertisement and fashion photography as well. And he is really interested in the idea of self. How do we represent ourselves, not only to the public, but how do we see ourselves individually? And this work is called Jean-Baptiste Bellet, and it is part of his diaspora series. So Jean-Baptiste was a real person. He, um, was, uh, he was born in Africa and then he became a slave in the West Indies. And eventually he saved enough money to buy his own freedom and he moved back to France where he worked his way up through society, which in 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century France wasn't easy for anyone, but he succeeded. And during the French Revolution, he was part of the um, national, I just lost the word, national convention in the 500, group of 500 of France who helped put together the new republic several times, because that was a revolution that lasted forever. But Jean-Baptiste is a man who history as a whole doesn't really talk about. You hear about other French leaders of the French Revolution, but he himself was a major player. So, so much that he actually had a real three-quarter length portrait like this done of himself in celebration of his acts during the Revolution. And that is what this portrait is based on. So Omar set himself up as Jean-Baptiste and he's, he's celebrating the voices of Africans who were no longer in Africa and how much they impacted history themselves, even though we don't hear their stories or hear their voices much in the history books anymore. And he's looking at this idea of being a figure who would have been well known in his time as Jean Baptiste would have been. And that idea of notoriety, but also having that sense of other, like I'm not like those around me who are also making an impact and therefore my name isn't as remembered through history. And he's kind of likening that through being a footballer or a soccer player because you have these very famous names in soccer who you hear for maybe 10 years and then you don't hear of them very much anymore, even though at times they can be touted as the next big thing. And so in a lot of this diaspora series, 
Omar includes some type of soccer paraphernalia in it to kind of have a dialogue with our own contemporary idea of someone who is famous but who can be other or from somewhere else like so many famous soccer players are come from other countries and play for another country and become famous No, no, not, sorry, continue. Okay. Um, not all of it is soccer gear. It's like the soccer ball that is soccer. But he's taking items from around his own home or his studio. And if you see 19th century Frenchmen, they have that kind of cummerbund type waistcoat that's odd. But he has used contemporary objects here and there to kind of jar you out of, oh, this isn't a traditional military three-quarter portrait. And then, like, is it a gym bag or something in his hands, the red bag? It looks like some kind of gym bag, yeah, and then we just have, like, a gauzy scarf and a red feather. Yeah, he just, he adds more texture and more contemporary life to a, photo, to a photograph that's of a portrait that's actually rather stuffy. And when did he make this? He made this in 2014. Yes, he's very contemporary. He has another one of Frederick Douglass behind you there. Yeah. And he has work throughout all three rooms as well. But this one specifically was from his Diaspora series, and it's, it's one of my favorites. He's, he's taken away his power by leaning him. You know, that's not a powerful position compared to the man next to him where he's posed like this is a very strong, sturdy man. And that's It's interesting that you note that because now we think of men as being very straightforward and arms crossed or hands on hips, but this is a very typical historical pose for men. You'll see kings, you'll see military leaders, political figures, always kind of leaning. And what they'll almost always have, he doesn't have one here, is they'll have a belt a lot of times with like a sword. That, that lean allows the sword to show all of it. So while we now think of this as a broken, say broken, not in a bad way, but you're breaking down the body as a feminine pose, when in reality, not reality, but previously, previously that, was strong, that was a strong, powerful man pose. And with that like cumberman around there, it kind of gave the idea that he had a larger stomach than he really did because it was also thought that if you have a belly, you have comfort, you have wealth, you have power. So very different from our modern idea of a strong man. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you brought that up. So do we have any other comments about the works in this gallery before we move on to constructing a pose. You never know if it's the same gentleman. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously he has a wig on here, but it's a very different look how he poses himself. It is. It's, it's him. It's the same. Mm -hmm. it's, the same, it's a self-portrait. Right? Yes. It's, he's imagining himself as these historical African figures. And same thing, he's holding the whistle here. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our next gallery. We got just about everybody yet. Okay, so now we have constructing a pose in this room. And before we get to the pieces I chose, I wanted to point out our couple over here where we have our traditional strong, wide stance man and our broken down feminine form. But it's just interesting to see even how the curators of this exhibition broke up the different photographs. Because while this one focuses more on like the pose and how we hold ourselves and present ourselves in photographs, or how we want our subjects to present ourselves. 
either photograph could have been put in one of the other areas. Now with constructing a pose, this focuses on works um, where we're looking at how historically or politically or socially a pose in a photograph can convey a message and how a self-portrait or a self-representation can be influenced by how we see celebrities or political figures or models presenting themselves in their photographs. If you think of kind of today's work with editorial magazines, you'll see models twisting and bending themselves into ways that really isn't humanly possible. And then you see younger people trying to also do that in their own photographs. So this, this part kind of looks at how constructed poses can influence our own self poses and ideas of beauty. And I wanted to compare these two photographs first. We, first we have Charles Teeny Harris and he was um, a, photograph, a photographer in Pittsburgh and he photographed um, the area's predominantly African-American um, population and he worked from 1935 to 1975 at the Pittsburgh, at the Pittsburgh Chronicle and he took over 70,000 images during his career. So as a photographic journalist, there is an element of kind of snapshots so you can get the area and what the area looks like. But there is a little bit of posing too, because in this photograph we have a waitress at the Crawford Grill in Pittsburgh, and we can see that it's a very busy night at the bar, at the restaurant, and she's likely over here at the till kind of turning in the ticket for one of her tables and she's stopped and she's posed for charles and we know that it's in the middle of her working day but we can see that she's also proud of herself of her station she's she's not just kind of turning like uh, she's turning she's like this is me i'm ready to take a photograph and that's important to note because after the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century, and really beginning in the 1920s and up through the 50s and 60s, in African American cultures throughout the U.S., we had a growth of pride, pride of place, pride of capabilities and self, um, self identity and self being a self-made person as individuals left sharecropping from the South and moved to the cities like Pittsburgh. So we have her, we don't know her family's history, we don't know how long she'd been in Pittsburgh, but as we saw through her post, she's proud of herself, she's working, she's taking care of herself and her family. And I think that's fun or interesting to juxtapose with um, Ticolia Salters she was taken in her photograph was taken in early 19 in the early 1990s she passed away in 1991 this print wasn't done in 2009 um and she and her husband were um they were employed they were well off and they spent their time off from their jobs having a produce and poultry farm and they still sold their produce on the weekends. And she's just, she's just sitting in her living room and she's proud of herself. You can tell that she's comfortable. And this series was called Small Towns, Black Lives. So she is from a small town. She and her husband are successful. And we can see like her pride and her comfort on her couch with her arm around it showing this is, this is my home. This is the home I've made for myself and my family. And I'm sure the fabric of this was a very nice couch. And my great grandma had similar ones. You can just feel that, that really sick, sick, slick silk against the kind of the, not rough, but like the kind of velvety textured areas there. And brocade. the brocade, yes, the brocade, the embroidery, the brocade, yeah. And it's interesting to see these two women who are separated by 40, 50 years and they even though one is at work one is in her comfort of home we can see the way that they have posed themselves it's likely that both both photographers would have posed them in a way but he's also let their own personality shine through and 
that is something we want to take into consideration while we look at our next comparison in here. Now we're going to compare woman wearing white apron with beauty queen. This photograph was taken around 1920, whereas the lady in blue was taken in 2016. And here we have a woman who would have been a maid, as we can tell by her uniform. And she's again just strongly, proudly, and simply looking at the camera. We don't see her stance though, we just see her from the bust area. Bust up, that's what that kind of half length is often called in portraiture. Whereas here we see our beauty queen and she's proudly almost defiantly standing in the road and her outfit is very different from our likely black and white apron set here. She's in electric blue, she's got the shoulder pads in, imposing kind of that strong manly pose that we've noted throughout a lot some of our photographs and we see here kind of where interpretation and in constructing your own pose and sense of identity has changed in the 30 years between these photographs she's her own woman she's strong and she's proud and I mean, she's staying in the middle of the street in New York City. That takes <laughs> some pride in and of itself. I, yeah, facing, facing the traffic. Um, but she is, she is a modern, strong woman, and she's, she's here. And, but what's interesting to note is both of these photographs, even though they convey different moods and they have different structures to them, is they would have probably equally been as artificial or constructed themselves because um, this lady likely would not have commissioned her own photograph if she was a maid. Gelatin silver prints were not cheap in the early 20th century, late 19th century. And we don't know what this photograph was for, but she's, she's having her photograph taken. She's told how to sit, how to hold her head, and that's it. Whereas this artist, um, Meng Benzema, he is an editorial and fashion photographer while also being a fine art photographer. So it's highly likely that he has instructed this model. I want you to stand here. I want you to wear this. I want you to have this expression on your face. But they both show how, how like media and artists can influence how we can be perceived. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. And the big hair, too, you know, kind of piled back. She's so got a turban on. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. so she's um, accessorizing for a specific look with mm -hmm. the turban, with the big glasses, and with the boots. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a. It's, it would be fascinating to know how much of that is her personal choice and how mm -hmm. much is. The artists. She's being. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. cre they're creating what yeah. they want as opposed to. What she's choosing. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh no, yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean thirties. I meant. I think I was thinking back to that one. Yeah, about a hundred years. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we can see how the constructed and specificity of her photograph is also translated onto how men are also perceived in fashion or in a magazine or any type of editorial controlled space because this is by the same artist the same photographer and this one is called today's man and what do we know about today's man from this photograph he's got snazzy shoes he has tailored pants a bespoke coat and He's got his collar up and accents poking through. He's fashionable. He, he's well read. He's bold. He's, yes. He's literate. That's an expensive magazine. Mm -hmm. Is that jewelry on the back side that we're seeing? Uh, watch. Watches. Yeah, so in other words, it's not, it's not people magazine. It's, 
yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a bold man. And so there's, yeah. so there's, there's this idea of today's man, he should be bold. He should be fashionable. And the same thing with our beauty queen. She's bold, she's fashionable, but yet these are both a constructed scene. You both have the exact same shade of blue. Mm hmm Yes. He's got interesting behind him is a really old building there. Mm hmm that, You know, that's and frankly hers is right there. It looks like the Brooklyn bridge is behind her yeah. arm there. Mm hmm So we're going to move into our third room. It was hard to choose what to talk about because we have so many different pieces. So in this room, we have photographers who are challenging these ideas of body and image and constructed beauty. And this area is called modeling beauty and beauty pageants. So at first you think, well, a beauty pageant, that's not really something that would really buck against perceived ideas of beauty. But the way in which these different artists have represented or captured beauty are what make it so, I don't want to say combative, but they're, they're going against perceived ideals of beauty and identity. And one artist is Carrie Mae Weems. She's um, one of the most well-known and prolific African-American uh, female photographers alive today. And this is from her kitchen table series. And when we think of a kitchen table, it's traditionally under the realm of the woman. It's one of the main areas of domesticity in the home. And Carrie created a whole series of 20 different photographs, all revolving around this kitchen table. She herself was the model, and she captured kind of the archetype of a woman and really explored what it meant to be a modern woman and looked at what it means to take care of your family, to have a husband, to possibly have a lover who might not be your husband, and like a battle of the sexes and battle of perceived ideals of beauty all at a kitchen table. Now, I think this one is especially interesting because it's they're all untitled and they're just described by what you see so this one is just called man and mirror so we have our lady and it appears as though two drinks have been finished but the man also looks like he just got there because he has his jacket on he has his coat on and it looks like she's also preparing to go out so we don't there's a lot of ambiguity in this photograph and she's making us really think about what does it mean to get yourself ready for the evening or who are you getting ready for has there anyone been there before but she even though we have all of these questions she is in control she looks very confident sitting there she is sure of herself and that's so this is a series yes that she has, mm -hmm. and the series itself is accessible you can find the whole series on her website. Um, we have a couple of, the, um, one or two of them in our own collection where it's a mother and daughter both doing their makeup at the table and the daughter is about six years old. It's, it's really cute. Um, but she has other pieces where she's setting out dinner for um, her family. She's at the table with who it seems to be her husband or she's surrounded by other women as they're fixing their hair. And it's just scenes that you would, you would naturally be like, oh, I know what this is. I understand. But then she has images like this thrown in there where you're like, oh, and you kind of rethink what it is that you're seeing. Yeah. You're welcome. And I, I highly recommend looking at all of them because it was only recently that I saw all 20. And this section also talks about how the the black press was really how individuals started to get different ideas of beauty and expand that vocabulary and that understanding out into the wider general public and we have some examples of that over here 
we have Pat Evans, Serena Williams, and then an individual who has, who's, her photograph is called Pickin, and she has her picks with her fist with them. And we see how these three women in their own way are defying preconceived ideas of beauty, either subtly or not so subtle. And the photographers, while they had staged them, they're really, they're making their audiences see that there is a different beauty found in African-American women. And it's not the same standard that you would normally see. Well, not, I don't want to say normally, that you would have traditionally seen in magazines or in movies or in the media. And another work that does that in even a stronger sense is this piece over here. The whole idea was to, is to really expand your, the understanding of what is beautiful, what can be beauty. And this piece um, is called Posing Beauty, and the artist is Hank Willis Thomas, and his main goal with this was to talk about how we have been conditioned to look at not just the female body, but specifically African American women at the beginning of like the advent of press. The whole background is a collage of centerfolds from Jet Magazine. <laughs> so when we're looking at these, these are clearly made specifically for the male gaze and it's from the male's point of view. It's very, it's tame by today's standards, but it's overtly sexual and the women are commodities. They're not looked at as just women. And on top of that, we have the more like demure, elegant, motherly images of beauty. There's no in between. You have your sexy woman who you want to obtain, or you have these more calm, traditional ideas of motherhood. And by throwing them up on the wall like this, he's showing you that He's showing viewers that you've been conditioned, and this is a condition that you can break, that you can get beyond, and see that there's more to beauty than a bikini, or than perfect makeup and jewelry. So, he's just expanding what can be. And that's what the whole exhibition itself is really about is showing these different men and different women and different scenarios that are different from mainstream art history or mainstream media and showing what their beauty is, what their inherent individualism is as well and a celebration of it. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, well that. Yes? I'd like to say, as a youngster, I can remember seeing the Jet magazine and always looking forward to seeing these beautiful women. Mm -hmm. Because for me, as a you know, young African American woman growing up in the, I grew up in the 60s, born in the 50s, but I began to see a lot, see these images, and it was nice and it was affirming mm -hmm. to be able to see some black beauty because we didn't see it in mainstream. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, yeah. You know, I really like like being able to see them, and my cousins, the males, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the appeal was not just to males, as you right. said. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. yeah. There were those different aspirations that come from seeing images like that, in terms of what you're surrounded with, and based on what people try to project on you, because this is not what you saw on television. This is not what you saw in a regular book. It's certainly not anything that was included in any history book, and I don't mean the fact that they're in bathing suits or whatever, but the overall beauty and mm -hmm. confidence, as well as uh, individualism that, that's projected in the different images. Mm -hmm. It shows some confidence, and it also shows a different walk in life than what is normally perceived socially. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really great part about it, because people don't venture outside of the space too often when they're the old physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's what I, I agree is great about the exhibition because you see that individualism and confidence and 
beauty and the images span from the late 19th century to present, present day. So you see history that hasn't been put in books, but it happened, and it's a celebration of all of that time. Mm -hmm. It has been, it's been traveling for, I think about 15 years. And we had it scheduled to be here, I think we booked it a couple years ago. So it's been a long time coming. We knew it was coming. There's a lot of popularity for it. Yes, there's a lot of popularity for it. And the images themselves have also kind of changed from when the exhibition began as well. So it's not exactly the same show. Um, Right. Um, I think it's over ten years old. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um yeah, I, I laid the show out, and since they had the three different themes, I really didn't want to break those themes up. I, I thought they were put together for a reason, and so I wanted to keep, keep those three different areas together, but then it was up to me to figure out what pieces in each room should go next to each other. So, so you weren't able to include all the pieces? Like no, we, we did. We included everything that was sent to us, okay. but um, over the last few years, um, artists have called work back and added other pieces, and there was one um, that had to be repaired and couldn't come. So, but yeah. So, Elizabeth, this piece is really fascinating. It's called Domesticated Lady. Mm -hmm. And she's in this setting which clearly doesn't look like your other women that you pointed out earlier, where they're yep. confident and they're in their property, like the woman who is the vegetable farm. She had her hands out. This is my territory. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm claiming this. And that woman doesn't. She look like she's holding herself up, like she's scared to sit on somebody's couch. I don't. I don't think I would say that either. I don't see that either. She looks to me like she looks very uncomfortable in that scene. I feel like it's like she's. I feel like she's kind of perched, almost like on a throne. Like this is yes, mine. Exactly. Very confident. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, I'm. I'm and whether, whether or not she's in her space. Based on her attire, it looks like she's a lady that is about to embark on a really pleasant evening. Mm -hmm. And um, she's going about her business. She is about her business. Mm -hmm. And the furnishings, depending on um, whether or not she's at a hotel That's or her living room, it looks like a, a it looks like a lobby of a hotel more so to me, just because just because of the staging, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a home in Chicago that I've been to that has a similar setting. Mm. It's very deco designed. Yep. And so, uh, no, I, she's, the look on her face it says, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I don't know if she's comfortable or not, like brought in and looks on her, she's not. Her, 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 the draping of her arm itself, and the way she has it, Yeah, I I thought she looked like this is mine. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Exactly what I thought. Yeah. But there's a lot of different things you can see. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I'd much rather she was you know, <laughs> claiming it than I would like, okay, now I'll sit in here and have that like here. I wanted to share in I don't think we do have a catalog online though. No. They're I don't think so. You'd have to check with the Paradigm Gallery and they'll know for sure. Yes. So that is part of it, the exhibit as well? That, all of that right there? Those pictures? Yes. Okay. Yep. You didn't show us the Denzel picture? <sighs> well. What is it? I said, now that's the best one for me. It's, it's one of my favorite ones oh too, my but. God, that is so good. That's a beautiful shot. We would just yes. we would just silently admire though. Oh, oh, okay. I wanted well, to we make sure we talked. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Oh, mm -hmm. that's very. Yeah. You don't know that. Yeah, they were two of my favorite singers. Mhm. Mhm. 
Mm-hmm. Did you know Nita sang the film on the Hi. Thank you everyone for joining us on Facebook and um, we hope that you keep coming to our curators tours and we're happy to see your comments.